And now, please join me in welcoming the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, Jennifer Stoddart. Thank you very much, uh, Daphne. Uh, welcome to this session, all of you here in the room, and hopefully all of you out there that are joining us at this uh, time. I'm really proud to say this is the third installment of our uh, new program, Privacy Speakers Series, in Insights on Privacy. Et l'un des objectifs de cette série de conférences est de présenter des points de vue inédits et accrocheurs sur la protection de la vie. Uh, points of view on uh, privacy protection, and it's also a way for the uh, for the commissioner's office to uh, remain up to date on protection of uh, privacy in terms of sociology, in terms of new areas. In the people here at OPC, that mobile is the new frontier. More and more today, we're connecting to the internet on the go using tablets, smartphones, and third-party applications. And these are just early days. With the dawn of Internet Protocol version 6, or IPv6, as it's more commonly known, we'll be connecting to the internet from more devices and sharing more of our personal information by way of these devices. So what's the problem, you'll say? Without question, the line between public and private is growing increasingly blurry. In our consumer consultations across Canada last spring, we heard that the challenge for many people using these new tools is that information that goes online tends to be public by default, privacy by effort. Et de notre point de vue, cette problématique est de point de vue, this is a very real problem. And it, 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 there, we, we need regulatory and legal measures, but they will not suffice alone. And uh, we have to be proactive. The creators and designers have to be proactive so that the privacy of persons can be appropriately protected so that people can and will want to use these is to reach out to new audiences in the hopes of engaging them in a dialogue about privacy. So that's all of you listening out there. As Privacy Commissioner of Canada, I have a mandate to increase awareness of privacy rights as well as to enforce Canada's privacy legislation. And as a first step in increasing awareness and compliance with privacy laws is gaining a better understanding of our audience, what does your environment look like? What are your challenges? How can we help and support you? We'd be interested in hearing about that directly from you. I'm told we have individuals representing the local development community in the audience today to hear from our esteemed guests. I'm really pleased you've come to join us here in this afternoon, and I hope that today can be the start of a new dialogue between us, the developers and the users, on privacy in a world of ubiquitous computing. Adam Greenfield and Azza Raskin are familiar names among the designers, developers, and the other innovators who are creating tools for the networked world. Our guests this afternoon do our attention because they are using a distinctly different lens to explore how our privacy is affected in this dynamic new environment, one where our data circulates through a myriad of internet-connected internet devices. I'm told that Adam and Azza are going to talk about the consequences of ubiquitous computing for privacy and explain how stronger privacy safeguards can be designed and can be built into those communication tools of tomorrow. And so with that, let me introduce our moderator for today's discussion, our head of public engagement and outreach, once again, Daphne Guerrero. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Commissioner. So as the Commissioner mentioned, mobile is, is the new frontier and um, we increasingly expect to be able to access the internet almost from anywhere and to improve our lives in ways we never could have imagined even 10 years ago. But as we rely more on these technologies, the more the technology relies on the data that we feed them. And as users, are we fully aware of the data that's being collected about us? Do we have a real understanding of how that data is being used and collected? The research that we've seen suggests that we don't. So how can we change that? So our two guests today will offer some possible solutions. And um, we approach them because they approach that problem from a very unique perspective, and that's a design perspective. Aza Raskin is an interface designer. He came by his interest in user experience early in life. His father, Jeff Raskin, was a well-known human computer interface expert and the inventor of the Macintosh computer. He was head of user experience at Mozilla Labs and creative lead at Firefox. <clears throat> and late last year, he left Firefox to run his own startup, Massive Health. 
While working at Firefox, he sought to develop a set of machine-readable privacy icons that would help users easily understand how their data was being collected and used. But first we're going to hear from Adam Greenfield. Adam is an internationally recognized writer and a thought leader on user experience design who has given considerable thought to the social, ethical, and design implications of ubiquitous computing. His book, Everywhere, looked at how an environment saturated with sensors and computers is transforming our lives, our communities, and the cities we live in. He offers broad guidelines for the ethical development of these powerful technologies. He's a former head of design direction for Nokia and a former instructor of urban computing at New York University. He's now the founder and managing editor and managing director of Urban Scale, an urban systems design practice in New York City. So I'll pass it now over to Adam, who's going to examine specific surveillance systems in public space and then outline some of the concerns he's associated with each of them. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me, by the way. I, I hate that language around thought leadership. Please don't ever, ever, ever think of me as a thought leader. Um, I, I have had the luck and the privilege of, of having grabbed onto some of these questions, it turns out, fairly early on in their technological development and certainly in their deployment and the ways in which ordinary people would be meeting them. And, and that's given me uh, a, a really unfair advantage. I've just been thinking about these things since the late 1990s, around the turn of the millennium. And, and that's really the only advantage I have. What do I at least mean when I talk about ubiquitous computing? Um, I, I think of it as a, a domain in which the processing power that we associate with those boxes that until very recently lived on our desk and, and more recently live on our lap and maybe in our hand, that the ability to gather information, the ability to process information, the ability to display information, the ability to transmit and receive information, and maybe even the ability to physically act on information has, has sort of diffused outward into the environment. And of specific and, and, and compelling interest for me personally, the urban environment. When that capability exists in the cityscape around us, when it's, it's a, a factor and a quality of, of the built environment itself and the urban fabric, um, it implies some pretty strongly different things for the ways in which we're able to go about our ordinary <coughs> activities in the city, uh, the ways in which uh, we're free to act, associate with other people, express ourselves. And it, it tends to cut against the grain of everything that we've traditionally used cities for, for about the last 5,000 years of city habitation. So humanity has learned over a very long period of time in a very diverse group of places to use cities for things like uh, starting over as a chrysalis for personal reinvention. Um, for example, if you grew up in a small town and uh, you, at the age of 16 or so, were tired with the opportunities of that town, the entire identity that you had developed um, in the context of living in that small place, you could historically run away to the great city, wrap an entirely new cloak of identity around you, and start life over again. And as we now know, the ability of uh, the environment itself to collect information, to make uh, identity persistent over time, all of the declarative media that we now use to express ourselves, to associate with our friends, all of these things, they make it very, very difficult for anybody to use the city for what we used to be able to use it for. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really interested in what happens to our notions of public space and how we protect the things that public space has historically been good for when that environment has been endowed with the new technological potential that it has. And there are some example systems that I use. I have a spectrum of, of kind of use cases or, or specific technologies that I'd like to walk through with you. And I'd like to explain why seemingly innocuous they might appear at first. Um, and I'm going to present to you a kind of increasing spectrum of some specific technological interventions into the urban landscape that um, at least they do for me, they begin to make me very concerned about what kind of information is being gathered about me, who has access to it, who profits from it, what use they or some other party may make of it. And um, I, how long do you want me to go on for? Because it could be a... Um, about half an hour, 20 minutes to 30 minutes okay. for each of you. Yeah, yep. sure. So, okay. So the, the first thing that I want to talk about is, is a traffic sensor. It's a Finnish system. It's called Valky. Uh, I believe that's V-A with an umlaut over it, L-K-Y. Uh, and and Valky is um, the very, very most basic sort of system uh, of this type that I want to discuss. And, and 
on its face, it's completely and entirely unproblematic. I don't think anybody um, has any sensible reason to object to this technology. It is uh, a, a traffic sensor, and, and the reason, it's not coincidental, perhaps, that it was developed in Finland. In Finland, it's dark, like 11 months of the year, 22 hours of the day. And so there's an extraordinary risk to pedestrians and bicyclists when crossing the street there, especially the further north you go, up, up above the Arctic Circle. It's literally dark a lot of the time. And so uh, on the highway, particularly in the smaller towns, it can be difficult to see people. Uh, and and uh, accidents and fatalities are, are a significant part of life there. Uh, what Valky is, is a, uh, it is a sensor package that lives on a lamppost and is wired to a very, very high intensity blue LED. And it simply registers the presence of a, a human-sized uh, thing moving through the landscape in, in the immediate vicinity of, of the road and the road crossing. And it shines this high-intensity blue LED at oncoming traffic, basically as a way of notifying uh, the, the drivers that, hey, you know, there's somebody who might be about to cross or might be about to veer into the road, um, and you should be extra, extra cautious and aware. So, yes, it's gathering information from the environment that is <coughs> about you, but I don't regard it as problematic for a couple of reasons. Um, one is uh, what is being done with it. It serves a social good. There's a very, very clear, very brightly demarcated social good that that collection of data is serving. Um, what's what's of, of further interest to us in this in this particular context is that that information isn't going anywhere. It's not being transmitted. Nobody's building up a statistical picture of activity at intersections, although they might in the future. But with this particular installation of this particular technology, that is not happening. It has local effect. It gathers local information and makes a local response to it, all in the service of some pretty clearly identifiable greater social good. So I don't know that many people who uh, would have a particularly strong argument to make against that. I certainly don't have any argument against it itself, myself. Um, but I think that it begins to establish for us one pole of a spectrum of contention. There are other such technologies that are deployed in our public spaces that are not nearly as acceptable to me personally and, and possibly to you as well and possibly to the societies in which they're installed. Um, the next example I generally give is a, uh, an advertisement that appeared in the subway system in Seoul, Korea. It was an advertisement for the Nikon camera company. And it was a multi-part system. It consisted of a red carpet that was rolled down the middle of a corridor in the subway system, underneath which were buried some load cells, which are, are essentially motion detectors. You move across them and you trigger a signal. And a billboard appeared alongside, and a billboard had an image of paparazzi with their cameras. And essentially, as you walked by the billboard, the load cells would register your position, and they would cause the flash bulbs on the paparazzi in the image to flash, as if they were all gathered there to take a picture of you. The idea was that you were coming down the red carpet, and you were at the focal point of the paparazzi's intention. Um, again, the, the information that's coming off of that load cell isn't really networked, it's not really going anywhere, it's not being gathered and archived and databased, and no analytics are being applied to it. Um, so there's nothing, you know, that is enduringly bad about this, but there's no real social good that's attached to this. It is advertising a commercial product, and what's more is doing so, uh, I have an image that I show um, that shows the effect of this ad when it's working as it should. It's actually kind of a, a disruptive and disrespectful part of, of the public space, I feel. You know, when people walk in front of this, all of a sudden they're startled from these flashes that go off from the side. And you can see from the facial expressions on the people that are walking by it, um, it's kind of uh, an, an upsetting or, or potentially distracting thing that, that, that happens to them. Um, so this to me begins to get a little bit problematic. Uh, it, it isn't really serving any sort of notable good whatsoever. Um, it's unclear to me if it even functions in support of its stated mission of selling cameras. It's not at all clear to me that that is an effective mode of advertising. Um, it, it's just kind of a, an unpleasant thing to have to encounter in public space. There's no really, there's not really any reason to regulate it necessarily. It doesn't seem to me to rise to the threshold of something that we need to control, but it's a less happy thing. And so that's sort of like the second phase of, of what we might call the instrumentation of public space. The third phase is represented by something which becomes quite a bit more of concern to me and it's a vending machine uh, that has been deployed recently in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, it's called Akure. 
And uh, the design community has been particularly interested in this vending machine because the entire front face of the vending machine is a, is a 47 inch high definition touch screen. And the idea is that, you know, it, it's been very carefully designed. It's very appealing, especially as, as uh, compared to most vending machines. Uh, it has a lovely selection of, of beverages available for you, and you approach it, and then the gestural interaction with it has been very well done. And, you know, you touch the screen, and, and it, it, it speaks to you, it interacts with you. It's all very uh, Japanese in that way. It's very, you know, um, there, there's, there's a quality to it that, that I can see would be appealing to some people. But here's where the problems begin for me. The Akure vending machine presents you only with selections that it has chosen algorithmically uh, as, as uh, to be appealing to you. It has a camera, it has motion sensors, it gathers information about you, it attempts to uh, ascertain your age and your gender, and it will serve you up a selection of beverages that its interior you know, algorithmic um, preparation has suggested to them. If you're a 25-year-old woman, you're likely to be interested in, in these beverages. If you're a 35-year-old man, here are this selection of beverages. Um, and, and that begins to be really disturbing to me. The idea that um, we can be known and, and so uh, numerically um, uh, characterized, is, is, it begins to make the hairs on the back of my head stand up. If it were just that my choice at the moment of purchase were constrained, that would already be problematic enough to me. But Akure is, of course, a network device. So not merely is the presentation pre-screened, pre-conditioned, but all of the information about what people actually do wind up purchasing is fed back into the development of future algorithms. So you begin to get this very prescriptive, normative idea that is made flesh in, in the algorithm. It's, it's prescriptive as to gender, it's prescriptive as to age, it's prescriptive, it's prescriptive as to all of these other contours that, you know, I, I think I certainly do, and I won't speak for anybody else, but I imagine this is not at all an uncommon thing. We like to feel that, you know, I'm not a number, I'm a free man, right? We like to feel that we're individuals. So it's sort of startling to have this, this seemingly everyday transaction so precisely algorithmically bounded. Whether or not my beverage preference, you know, the one that I came to the machine with, is actually in line with what their algorithmic prediction is going to be, is less important to me than the fact that my choice is constrained. I don't like the predictive model that's bound up in this. I don't like the fact that this machine is generating predictive models based on user behavior. And I don't like the idea that somebody else, some other party, is generating extraordinary commercial value on my latent behavior, on the behavior that, that I've neither been informed is taking place, nor indeed has my consent been asked for at any place along uh, during this interaction. And that leads us to possibly the most disturbing example I have of all, uh, which is the next phase of all of this, uh, is a, a billboard, a video billboard, or, or more precisely, uh, a, a back-end package of software analytics um, that is licensed for use with video billboards. Uh, it is um, offered to the public by a French concern called Kividi. Uh, Kividi is, of course, Latin for he who watches, and it's an entirely appropriate name. Their, their software analytics package is called Vidi Reports. And it, the entire system works like this. It's a fairly standard video billboard. In the frame of the billboard is a camera that's about the size of the one that's in your mobile phone right now. And it, it's a dark frame, metal frame. So it's, it's not impossible to see the camera, but it's not particularly easy to see either, nor are you told that it's there. There's merely video content going on on the screen. So what happens is that uh, Vidi Reports attempts to uh, characterize and quantify the nature of attention that is being paid to what's on the monitor uh, on the part of the people passing in front of that camera. And again, you're not told that this is happening. Nobody's asked you for your consent. The analytics software is capable of looking at things like uh, indices of facial bone structure. So it's able to say, you know, you belong to one of, of four or five ethnic categories. It's able to assign you to one of four age bands. Certainly able to ascribe gender to you. And by uh, a luminosity counter that basically um, 
meters reflections off of eyeballs, the Kaviti Vidi report system is even, even able to see uh, whether you're paying attention to the billboard or not. If you combine this with some laser eye tracking technology that is already widely available that does not happen to be present in this particular instantiation of this technology, you can also see particularly moment to moment what part of the video image people are attending to. So this to me has breached some unconscious threshold somewhere in there. It's, it's extraordinarily disturbing to me that this is happening and as a matter of fact I, I argue fairly forthrightly that we should not permit this. Certainly in in New York City, the city that I'm from, um, I'm working with, with some partners on, on uh, drafting uh, legislation for the regulatory community that would essentially not allow this sort of data collection to happen. Why is this so concerning to me? Well, um, it, it has to do with notions of value and the exchange of value. It's not merely that you're generating value for the, the, uh, the owners of the billboard or the people who are uh, showing content on it or Kaviti themselves. Um, when you do attend to it. It's that even if you're walking by in the background, you're generating very, very significant data for them, very significant value for them. If the imagery that is on the screen at this moment fails to capture your attention when, we're, when you're within the ambit, the capture radius of that camera, that tells them something they want to know. Because obviously they want to optimize the content on the screen so that it captures as much of your attention as possible. And we all know where this goes after a couple of more iterations of this. I mean, eventually, depending on the particular demographic and psychographic that, that the advertiser wants to capture, I think we can all imagine what kind of content is going to be on the screen at almost all times. Because there are certain images and, and sets of images and tropes that we know entrains attention very reliably. I personally don't want to live in that city and I certainly don't want to be generating value for some third party where I have not been offered a way to share in that value. And we had a conversation a little bit earlier on um, at that point where, where I raised this issue of transactionality and, and I was asked a very good question. They were like, well, then you have a transactional model of, of privacy. You don't have a rights-based expectation of privacy. And uh, it's an excellent question. It doesn't happen to be the case. I do have a very strongly rights-based conception of personal privacy. The trouble is is that I don't think that there's any way to uh, regulate effectively to that conception uh, uh, without um, writing regulations so incredibly granularly as you'd have to essentially write a new body of law for every single use case. So I think a, a transactional approach is probably going to be more uh, pragmatically efficient in this particular context. And what I mean by that is where information is being gathered from me either individually or in the aggregate, then individually or in the aggregate, I need to be offered something of equal worth to what I'm giving away. Um, there are some other test cases, use cases, observations I've made. My wife and I uh, give a series of walk shops around the world, walking workshops, where uh, these are 90-minute walking tours of public space where we attempt to um, call people's attention to all of the things which are currently gathering information from that environment. And it turns out to be quite an astonishing variety in most places. Um, people are just not aware of this. So we walk through the city, uh, 10 to 15, 20 people maybe at maximum. We walk around, we look, and, and you know, the, there are the obvious cameras. There are the less obvious cameras. There are the entirely not obvious sensors and, 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 and other information collection systems which are physically buried in the landscape or otherwise obscured from view. There are all of these different modalities and channels and registers of information that's being gathered from public space and I would argue that every single one of them represents in some way value that is being extracted from your activity that you are not being offered anything in exchange for. Uh, a favorite example has to do with uh, the bus stops in Wellington, uh, excuse me, in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, apparently, the, the, uh, the bus stops uh, in Brisbane have been uh, fairly crudely instrumented with sensors that just allow uh, the, the transit authority to know um, that they are occupied and roughly by how many people they're occupied at a given time of day. Um, that is information that's being generated for them by our unconscious use of the bus system. And, and certainly, um, we talk about discretionary and dependent riders in public transit and so th there's, there's a very large percentage of the user base of any public transit authority 
that are not discretionary. They're not choosing to take public transit. They take public transit because they have to uh, for economic or, or social reasons. Um, and, and so the, the discretionary um, body of users may have some choice. But the dependent riders of this transit si system are therefore having value extracted from their use of it, whether they want to or not. They're compelled to agree to that extraction of information and value from them. If that was just for the use of the transit authority themselves or even for the municipality in terms of you know, where to site services or how to more efficiently provision transit, I wouldn't have a problem with it. The problem arises when uh, the transit authority sold that information that was being gathered by the bus shelters to an advertising firm on an exclusive proprietary 10-year contract. So nobody else can have access to that information now. That, that is now being used to fine-tune advertising um, and, and to further target people for, ex, uh, for exposure to commercial messages. So there's a valid question there as to whether the public has derived any benefit from that. Some people would argue that, yes, presumably, licensing that data to the advertising agency generated some revenue for the municipality or for the transit authority, and, and that is where uh, the, the, the symmetry of value resides. I'm not entirely convinced by that logic. Um, myself. I, I, I tend to think that things should be open and equally accessible and equally available. So I think that the public realm has had some value taken away from it uh, and, and has not fully had the same register of value returned to it. Um, but I, I also have an example of how very, very difficult it is to legislate around these issues or, or, or to begin thinking about them in a regulatorily significant manner in a democracy. In Wellington, New Zealand, uh, a, a ring of CCTV cameras was proposed for the city center. Um, and they were originally and legitimately intended to s serve a, a, an overriding public good, that of traffic safety and traffic management. And as a matter of fact, the question of whether to install these cameras or not was put to a citizen referendum. The citizens of Wellington were asked, you know, will you vote, yay or nay? Do you want these cameras installed in your environment? Um, the referendum passed. The citizens embraced the cameras, uh, and they were installed. So far, so good, you'd think except for what happened the year after, when a new back-end analytics package, again, became available for the CCTV cameras. So all of a sudden, the, the physical cameras, their physical field of operation, nothing, nothing had changed about that, but what you could do with the cameras did change. As a matter of fact, in this case, there was a facial recognition analytics package that was applied to the image stream coming off of these cameras that was uh, intended for the use of the police. The question of whether or not to upgrade these cameras with the analytics software was not put to a referendum. And as a matter of fact, even I find that, you know, it's sort of a strange notion, isn't it? I mean, we can understand a referendum about a physical object or set of objects. We can say, do we want to emplace these technologies here? That seems like um, it just comports with our kind of uh, native or, or raw understanding of, of what you apply law to. The idea that we would have to have a new referendum every time a new release of the software became available seems a little bit burdensome, onerous, even a little bit absurd to me. Um, and yet, that is sort of what's necessary. So I, I don't have any really good, clear answers about that. I just know that the current way that we're doing things is not sufficing to protect the, the public realm, the public domain, the citizens who, who move, live, and operate in that realm. Um, so I'm left to propose something which is not entirely satisfactory. It is not enti it's, it's certainly not the best of all possible worlds. But I think it might be the best deal we can get. And that is uh, to fairly rigorously define a class of objects and services in our environment. We're going to call them public objects. And then to define in law, in regulation, what rights and responsibilities the people who deploy those objects have with regard to privacy and data collection. And I'm going to offer you my definition of a public object to the best that I can remember it off the top of my head. And then I'm going to offer you my suggestion as to, to what provisions um, be, uh, be operative with regard to those objects. And then I'm going to leave it there because I, I think that um, it's best for the community to discuss that definition and see if it comports with their own understandings 
of public space and objects and services operating in the public space and see if those proposals make any sense for them. I will say that these are things that I'm working very, very hard to get written into law in, in New York City where I'm from. So here's my definition of a public <coughs> object. A public object is any resource that is cited in or taking effect on public space or the common spatial domain that has the ability to gather, process, display, receive, transmit, store, or take physical action on information. It could be something like a piece of street furniture with sensors on it, like the bus shelters we've discussed. It could be a camera that's on private property but is aimed into the public common spatial domain. Um, or it could be something that, uh, <coughs> despite being located nominally on private property, is in a thoroughfare or right-of-way that is de facto used as public space. So any object or service that has those capabilities that is located within that sort of definitional boundary, we're going to call that a public object. And then I assert that we should demand of public objects that they be open, addressable, queryable, discoverable, and potentially even scriptable. I'm going to say exactly what I mean by that. Um, in technological development, we have uh, a definition of open uh, that was promulgated by the open source and free software community. That, that I'm quite fond of. And, and uh, I'm not going to be able to remember it in detail or rigor off the top of my head, so I am going to suggest that, that you look it up online. Um, but there are principles of openness that include the right to understand how it was developed, how the object or service was developed, the right to uh, certainly use and modify the source code, uh, and, and the, the, uh, the restriction that if you modify it, that your restrictions themselves be released to the public under the same license that you are offered the open object product service or resource under. So that's kind of the starting place for me. But I also mean open as an API. Open as in something that its specifications are published to the public, they're available, and it, you are essentially told what this thing is and how to use it. When I say addressable, I mean that it have an address in IPv6 namespace, which means that it have its own defined numeric unique identifier, so I can refer to this lamppost that gathers information and not this one, or this traffic signal, or this bollard, or this camera, and not another. That it be queryable, that we be able, using the right interface, the right service, we can pull information off of these open public objects and that depending on the context and my permissions and the circumstances, potentially even that these open public objects be scriptable, by which I mean you should be able to push information back to them, instructions back to them. Now, this last provision is fraught with risk and potential for all kinds of baleful outcomes. So it, it is a conversation that you know I, I, I would need to speak for an hour about all the reasons why I think it's worth offering that kind of access to people when there is a known measurable downside risk that's bound up in that. Nevertheless, I sincerely do believe that defining such information gathering technologies as public objects and by demanding in regulation and law that they be open and freely accessible to all parties is the only way that we can keep asymmetries of information and power <coughs> from happening around them. The only way that we can pre pre excuse me, prevent them from being exploited by parties that would commercially gain from them and, mind you, from the additional second order inferences and behaviors that you could derive from that information, the only way to protect our rights and, and, and our uh, our well-established understanding of what it means to be in public space in a city. Um, I, uh, all of this is available online if you search for the phrase, uh, in quotes, public objects or open public objects. Um, you'll probably find it argued there uh, in much more detail, rigor, and depth than I've been able to go into here. Um, I've certainly offered the definition of something you know, that is addressable, queryable, scriptable before. But in order to make any of this happen, we need to do an awful lot of consciousness raising first. 
because these images are on uh, th these issues are on virtually nobody's radar um, to the degree that they are on certain institutions' radar. Um, these are people who currently derive some kind of advantage, a differential advantage or an asymmetrical advantage from the gathering of data, and don't necessarily want it regulated or even discussed. Um, and ultimately, and, and I'm sure Isa is going to get into this. Um, these are very abstract issues for a great many of us. They don't really have teeth. It is not until you, you feel personally and intimately that your privacy has been some way violated or that you've been somehow robbed from that you're likely to agitate for any kind of change in the fundamental conditions or the envelope of circumstances and regulation that surrounds these technologies. I don't want it to be too late before we start thinking about these things and frankly before we start regulating around them. So I'm very, very grateful uh, very thankful for the opportunity to present before you, um, and I hope that you, uh, I, I absolutely do not mean my uh, reflections and offerings to be the final word on the subject. They're merely putting something on the table so we can begin chewing it apart, discussing it, seeing how it's relevant in your lives and in the cities through which you move. I've given a, I've given a perspective that's very much my own from my own uh, <coughs> techno-social background from the city that I live in, I offer uh, what I've brought to you in, in the hopes that it's productive for your thinking and that you take it somewhere that is directly, personally relevant to the lives you live here in Ottawa. And thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Adam. Well, as the commissioner had mentioned, <clears throat> we're really here to bring new ideas and put those new ideas on the table, so we're really pleased to hear from you today. And, uh, and I found your comments on, um, uh, on a possible solution to be very interesting. I mean, what, you've, what you're proposing is really a radical rethink of how we approach the privacy challenge. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see how you've, you've suggested that perhaps privacy could be available to us through increased openness and transparency. Um, but uh, it's a lovely segue there when you talked about how first we need consciousness raising. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned in my introduction for Aza, he, uh, while at Mozilla, he had worked on the development of a consciousness raising tool, these privacy icons. So today he's going to walk us through the development of those icons and discuss other strategies and tools that could be used um, to, uh, to enhance awareness among users. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and always a scary thing to go after Adam. So. He has such wonderful examples. So I'm going to try to get exactly one point across uh, in this talk, which hopefully will consist of me saying the point over and over again for 30 minutes. Um, and, and that point is our job as, as designers, um, our job as, as creators of systems, and our jobs as, as legislators is to make the invisible visible. Right? So that's the phrase I want you guys to remember. We are here to make the invisible visible, because privacy is by and large invisible. It doesn't matter until it bites you, right? So possibly the best thing that we can do, as I've said before, is uh, to orchestrate an info apocalypse um, where all of our data really gets out and bites us. Because if we do, we're, we're, you better believe we'd do something about it, right? So why, why is privacy worth, worth protecting? I often think of privacy um, like an umbrella. It's sort of useless and heavy most of the time, and you always lose it in, in public spaces. Um, but besides that, like you only want it when it's raining. Uh, and it's when you're getting wet, that's when you really wish you had your umbrella. And the same thing is true of, of privacy, privacy protection. Um, and why is privacy important to, to maintain? Well, actually, it goes back to a quote by, by uh, Shaw um, that, that always struck me. Uh, and it's possible because I was just a really weird kid. And it was that the, the reasonable people, the reasonable man, uh, accepts the world as it is and forms himself to the world. The unreasonable man, or, or woman, I should say, uh, doesn't change for the world. And he changes the world to him. Therefore, all progress must come from the unreasonable man or woman. So when you look at society, uh, the same thing is true. All progress must come from a part of society which is by definition not the norm, because if it was the norm, that wouldn't be progress. Right? So social deviancy in some sense, progress always happens at the edges of society. And if privacy were gone, if everyone had perfect visibility into everything everyone else did, there could be no social deviancy. Right? 
if we had CCTV cameras everywhere through a city uh, 50 years ago, we would never have got interracial couples. This is an argument that I think Lawrence Lessig makes very, very strongly in, in free culture, and I'm just uh, being a conduit for his words. But privacy is important as a fundamental right. So how do we protect that online? That's the, the question that, that we were setting out to, to answer at Mozilla. And it came back to how do we make the invisible visible? Because right now you sign up to use a service and you have no idea how the service is using your data. And you're like, okay, fine. You can go read the terms of service. Um, but as I think one infographic delightfully pointed out, the terms of service for Facebook is longer than the Constitution of the US, right? which is, is a problem. Um, if you can found an entire nation on a document, certainly you can do a site which lets you share updates on a wall and celebrate people's birthdays. So how do we, how do we solve that? What's, what's going on here? Um, in fact, the, 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 the Washington Street Journal uh, did something interesting. They went through and they looked at all of the terms of services uh, for various sites, in, including that for, for Mozilla's. And they found some, some pretty damaging things, um, some stuff that slipped by even our own lawyers. And we, I don't know if everyone knows, but Mozilla uh, is a not-for-profit. We're a public benefit organization um, that just happens to have you know, almost half a billion people using one of their, their products. Um, and even we had, had holes in our, in our terms of service and, and privacy policy. And it's because they're opaque documents. They hide things, they bury things, um, and getting to some of your points, it's a contract by adherence. So contract by adherence means, uh, you know when you, when you buy a ticket um, to go to a bowling alley, that's probably not a true thing. Uh, what do people, anyway, yeah. Um, or when you buy a ticket to go to a rock concert, it has like, by having bought this ticket, you agree to all of these terms. Parking lots. But yeah, parking lots are very much like this. Um, there's no way for you to cross something on being like, actually, I don't agree with that. AR, sign my initials, um, you give me $20 when I lose something. You can't do that because they're taking advantage of the asymmetry of the situation. It's exactly what Adam was talking about. So how do we start to, to erode that? Well, the Washington Street Journal went through, looked at all these terms of service and said, like, here are all the issues. Because they paid a lawyer to go find these things, um, to do the work that you should be doing if you actually cared about what's happening to your data, but you know, Facebook's value uh, is, is too great. Google's value is too great. Um, so, so what would help? Well, instead of trying to tackle the problem, and this is what I think the, the last group of people did, and it, it didn't work very well, um, tackle the problem of let's codify everything in privacy. Let's have a taxonomical approach um, to all the bits of a privacy policy, the way your data gets shared. Um, put that into a big document. Let's make it XML because everyone loves XML. Um, and, and throw that up on a website, right? That was P3P. Did it work? No. Why? Interface. Um, it took the invisible and made it more differently invisible. And what we needed was a way of making the invisible visible. So this is where the idea for privacy icons was born. And it was born from, in fact, one very simple uh, idea. And that is, don't say, let's encode everything about privacy. Um, it's, what should people care about in privacy. When you go to a website, you start using it, what are the four things that you should care about most? Now, if I was to go back to, to some of the example Adam had, um, if that really scary display that tracks your, your motion, knows your gender, your sexual preferences, um, how big your wallet is, things like that, if that had some sort of iconography on it that said, by the way, by walking past here, it's collecting your data, uh, they're making money off of it. In fact, they generally make this much money off of it. Like, if you had those things, you get a little bit annoyed. You get viscerally mad um, because what was invisible is now visible. Do you have recourse? N not yet, but at least you know. So it takes those investigative reports that the Wall Street Journal does, and it makes it easy enough for any concerned citizen to do. That's a big step forward because that means there's awareness. Um, so what the privacy icons meant to, to do is to answer that question. What? are some simple things um, that people should care about. And the most important one that came up, and we, we got together a group of people from the FTC, from the EFF, um, from, from all the, the major the groups, uh, and, and came up with the most important one we thought was, was secondary use. Do most people know what secondary use is? No? 
All right. Um, two people, one said something, one shook their head, and the other raised. This is going to be interesting. Um, secondary use is, is sort of a simple idea, although hard to codify. And the idea is, is your data being used for the reason that you intended it to be used? Um, it's very much like when you run somebody over, as, as I'm sure you all do constantly. What matters there is, is the motivation. Um, did you intend to run them over or not? And you will have vastly different sentences if you did and didn't. Well, sort of similarly uh, with, with secondary use. If you buy something on Amazon and they share your address, is that a bad thing? Right? I would sort of start saying, like, yeah, especially if they share that address with a third party that, that I don't care about. Um, but what happens if they shared it with, with the UPS so that it could be delivered to your house? You're like, ah, yeah, that, that sort of makes sense. Um, what happens if they shared it with an advertiser? Or uh, it turns out that, <laughs> that if you buy those, those things for your truck that like give your truck balls, um, it turns out that, yeah, I know, um, I'm from America. Uh, if you get those, there's a really high correlation between that and a really poor credit score. Who knew? Um, <laughs> Right? So what happens if you bought that and they gave that information away to, to the, the credit people, and now you're negatively affected for, for having made a purchase, even though you might actually have bought them as a gag gift? Right? Um, so that's bad secondary use, is where they share it to people that doesn't facilitate the thing that you were trying to do, which is to have those things sent to your house for no particularly good reason. Um, so secondary use, was, we found, was really, really important. We found that the feeling that people are taking your data and profiting from it, that just was a viscerally bad reaction. Now, often that's covered under secondary use. Um, but most people get mad about it, so we're going to bubble that up. Um, and we had a couple other things in there, too, about uh, how hard will the company fight uh, if they're asked to give over your data to government or law enforcement. Uh, interestingly enough, this was always the most contentious uh, because there's so much gray area here. If, the, if a police officer comes to you and says, like, hey, can we have your data? We're tracking down a, a, a pedophile. They might get away. All we need is this data. It shows where they were, some sort of four-square check-in. Um, and you're left in a really hard position. Like, is the, the police, are they, are they lying? They're probably not lying. Uh, should I give them this data? Do I have to inform the user that I'm giving this data? Uh, it, it becomes really gray. Um, but we think it's an important thing to, to call out that people that a company should be able to say, to the extent that I can, I will fight requests for, for data. Um, I, guess, I don't know how many of you know this, but Google has over 100 people dedicated to just their paralegals, just uh, filling out uh, subpoena requests, um, because they get requested all the time. At Mozilla, we were very, very careful. We, we had all of two lawyers. Um, and we didn't want to keep any data that could ever be subpoenaed, because as soon as that gate was opened, it was going to be flooded. Um, and so as, as you guys, because I know some of you are, are developers, think about how to develop your own product. Just, just be a little bit careful about that. Don't, don't overthink it. But do remember that any data that you take and store, somebody else can ask for later. Um, and it can, can be a liability. Uh, there, there's a, a phrase that that we like to use in, in copywriting, one of the most useful ones, and I apologize since it's a little bit vulgar, um, which is if you are trying to answer a question like, what, what do you do, or what does your startup do, uh, and you try to answer that in writing, it, it'll probably be like a paragraph long and talk about synergies and, and integrated databases. Um, but instead, if somebody came up to you and was like, what the hell do you do, you'd probably answer in one line super succinctly. Um, and so when you take data, ask yourself the same thing. You're like, why the hell did I take that piece of data? Um, or why the hell does this company need this data? Uh, and if the answer is sort of like, eh, well, you probably don't need to take that data. Um, so this all comes back to how do you bubble up information? One of my favorite examples of this comes from uh, London very early, like in the, the 1800s. This is just when taxi cabs were getting started. And this is sort of like the, the mark of the free market principle, right? Get into your taxi haggle over the price, you arrive at a fair market price, you go where you want to go. But that, of course, didn't work because you get into a taxi, it takes a long time to find another taxi, this is still true today. Uh, and so people got gypped again and again and again and again. The value or the, the price 
of figuring out the price was high. So what happened is, is that, um, this is where I learned about it, people started making beautiful maps of, of say, London. And they draw little circles all over London. So you knew if you're going from place A to place B, uh, how many of these circles there were, and therefore how much uh, money it should cost. So it started to, to be legislated um, and regulated because the free market didn't work because the value of information or of getting the information was, was too high. Uh, and eventually, the Germans came up with a taxi meter uh, where it would just automatically calculate it for you and it was standard price, standardized across all taxis. That worked because the visibility of the cost uh, was made very low. Um, or rather, the visibility was made high, the cost was made low. And the same thing needs to happen with terms of service. So when you go to a website, right now it's really hard for there to be a privacy marketplace because you don't know what they're going to do with your data. There's no easy way of figuring it out. Privacy icons were intended to make it so you could glance across the top and say like, well, regardless of everything else it says in this document, at least these three things are true. Um, it doesn't use my data for secondary use. There is no bartering going on for my data. And uh, well, they actually, they will, they will capitulate to, to governments um, if they're requested for, for my data. And you can make choices based on that. And instead of trying to get Google and Facebook to adopt them, because the value proposition for these companies are still way, way, way too high, um, you're, you're going to use them regardless. We're going to go after second tier sites. And these are the sites that already put just beneath the place where you sign up for their email or for their, their mailing list. It says, like, we will never spam you, right? That right there is a privacy market in action. They're telling you something about how they're going to use your data in exchange for that data. And all of those second tier sites, which actually make up the bulk of the internet given the long tail, um, these are the kinds of sites that have already come out and saying, like, we want something that makes it easier for us to demonstrate that we are good actors. And that's, that's really where, where privacy policies, uh, privacy uh, icons comes in. It's a creative commons for, for privacy policies. So there are a couple, oh, hello. Um, there, there are a couple other interesting uh, things out there in this space. Um, and they're all things that take advantage of the fact that as Mozilla, of course I, I don't speak for Mozilla any, anymore, but um, as Mozilla you, you have a purview of, of half a billion users. What, what can you do with it? How can you bubble this up so that people see it? Um, one thing we just implemented is, is do not track. And these are headers. Did, have people, who hasn't heard of do not track? One, two. Okay, how many people are actually awake? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, and people that just don't like to raise their hands? Mm hmm. Um, so do not track our, our headers. They go along with an HTTP request. So in the very lowest level of a request that goes off to the server that says, like, give me this document, or give me this web page, um, are a whole bunch of, of little bits of information that tell you, like, when the page should expire, um, what the cookies are, all, things like that. Um, and one of them now is, is do not track. And it was first implemented by Mozilla, and now I think it's in IE9 and Safari 5 point, whatever it is. Um, and it says, hey, dudes, just please don't, don't track me. Like, all of you guys who are using um, a behavioral tracking and cookies, just, just don't, please. Uh, and what's cool about this is this gives you plausible, um, not plausible, but deniability, the other one. Um, it says that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? You set something saying, I think the things that I'm doing right now are, in fact, private. Do not track me. Um, and in the US, that's awesome, because that means our government can't go look at it, because you, you have an expectation of privacy. Um, so that's a really good first step. And the CDT has another proposal, which is really, really interesting, called privacy rule sets. And they're saying um, that we'll take the exact same approach as copyright. Copyright has no technical backing, right? It's just this little mark you put on the page, and it comes a whole bunch of, of warranties about what people can and cannot do with the thing you just wrote. But there's nothing backing it. Um, and the same way, we can do that with, with privacy. Um, so imagine every piece of information that you submitted, your browser appended to it a rule set that says, you can use this for commercial use, you can't use this for commercial use. You can use this to track me, you can't use this to track me. There's some set of things you can and cannot do with my data. And so imagine you had gone into your browser and you said, every time I submit my email address, I never want it to be used for secondary use. And therefore, um, and every time you submit it to a website, that website gets it. 
Now, at the beginning, nobody would do anything with it. But if enough people started using it over as part of the browser, very soon every piece of data you sent would come with a little bit of metadata talking about how it was going to be used or how you wanted it to be used. Um, and therefore, you've expressed a preference. And as soon as you expressed a preference, we can start talking about how to, to use it um, and how it should be used or how it shouldn't be used. Uh, because right now, every piece of data that you make is devoid of, of intent. So where does that leave us? Because that was just sort of a big running monologue of awesome, um, if I don't say so myself. So what does that leave us? That leaves us with the idea that I said at the very beginning, that our job is to make the things that are invisible and boring right now, the things that would bite us, visible. So that the small group of concerned people, because um, the vast majority of people, even if we had privacy icons fully implemented, rolled out across most of the websites on the web, would, would still just not care. But they have a friend that does. Um, and that friend would tell them something. Uh, in the same way that your, your friends would tell you what uh, software you should or shouldn't install, or what uh, hard drive to get, or what computer to buy, You'll have a small group of people that care, that get it, and because the, the cost of adoption is low enough, we'll actually know roughly what they're talking about because they haven't had to wade through terms of service. They'll be able to choose service A over service B. So we have to make the things that were invisible visible. Um, and that's, that's really the, the thing I wanted to get across. Well, I think both of you, both of you gave some um, really intriguing solutions for what large organizations, institutions, governments uh, can do to, uh, to enhance awareness around privacy. But I'm wondering, um, especially because we have people here in the audience, and I would hope that uh, on, on YouTube, um, developers and, and, and other folks who are creating these tools online uh, watch this. What kind of concrete suggestions or solutions would you have for them? Like, what can they be doing in their day-to-day -day work to uh, to to consider privacy as as, uh, as part of their workflow? So one of the things we we did at Mozilla early on, um, as as we started to play with the privacy icons, is that we went through all of our terms of service um, and we diagrammed them out. Uh, this is two two things. This is one writing it down in smaller bits of English so that it was understandable to mere mortals. And two, it was like, all this data goes up here, then goes over here. And in doing so, we discovered that even though we thought we were in best actors, uh, there were holes in our, in our document, which we then fixed. Um, I think we were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, the value of, of a manual or writing something down is, is huge. So in, in design, this is often true. Um, the shorter the manual it is for, for your product, the better your product is. Canonical example, look at digital watches versus analog watches. A digital watch has a manual roughly this big, involves lots of mode settings and, and cursing. Um, the analog watch has one line, and it's pull, crown, and turn. Right? It, it tells you something. So when you're thinking about privacy and how your data is being shuttled around and whether you're, you're being pro-privacy or, or not as privacy preserving, doing the very simple exercise of writing down where your data is going, how long it's stored, um, and trying to explain it to somebody else, explain it to a user and not in legalese, turns out to be an incredibly effective tool at making your company much more uh, aware, or your product much more aware of privacy, and therefore able to do something about it. Extraordinarily atypically, I actually have a quasi-technical suggestion to a quasi-technical audience, and there are probably people who are infinitely more sophisticated than me about this question. Um, and it's just a recognition that, that I've, I've had over the years that I've been thinking about these things. And that is, we hear a lot of talk about anonymous or anonymized data. And we're, we're very often told that, oh, we shouldn't worry about something because the data's been scrubbed, it's been anonymized, it's been hashed, whatever. Um, my, my recognition, and, and I will try to put it into, um, I just don't think that there's any such thing as an anonymous data set unless that data set exists in such splendid isolation that it cannot ever, in principle, be cross-referenced against anything else. What I've learned is that relational analytics have gotten so good that um, virtually any ostensibly anonymized data set can be parsed, and, and as a matter of fact, the more data you have, you know, people used to rely on a, a kind of security through obscurity, um, and that, you know, they said, well, the data set is so large, you know, any individual record is going to disappear in, in that. It's going to be like, you know, pulling a seashell from the ocean. 
it turns out the more data you have, the easier it is to pull individual records out of it when you can compare it against one or two or three other databases. Um, the canonical example is the two reporters, not even from the technological, uh, from a technological background, but from the Associated Press's um, business reporting staff. Um, they were given some anonymized data or ostensibly anonymized data by Yahoo years ago, and they said that uh, these are queries that we have, um, and and we are so confident that um, you know that there's there's no connection between these queries and your ability to connect them to individuals that we're going to give them to you all of these records to hack on. Uh, I think they gave them two hundred thousand queries uh, within forty eight hours. Two non technically trained business reporters were able, just using not even any particularly elaborate analytical machinery, just using good old-fashioned reportorial skills and shoe leather, were able to pull a specific woman in a specific suburb of, of Atlanta, Georgia, out of the record and, and identify her as having had a very high probability of making, you know, query number 174,221 through 229. And they confirmed it by actually getting in contact with her and saying, did you ask about urinary tract infections in dogs? And she was flabbergasted. She was absolutely astonished. She's like, how did you figure that out? Well, you know, they had publicly available records. They were able to do public uh, database searches from things like home ownership records and, and, and publicly available telephone records. They didn't even need a subpoena. They were able to piece together this pattern of fact um, in a very short amount of time using fairly uncomplicated means. So my caution to those of you who are in the data collection business or who gather information about people in any way, shape, or form is that uh, in addition to lying, you may be putting yourself at risk of legal liability by, by uh, suggesting to people that they are, they are protected by the anonymization of the data set. Because I don't think any such thing is, is possible anymore unless literally it's in uh, you know, some kind of, of shielded container that's kept separate from all other potentials of cross-referencing. To, to drive that point home, um, yeah, just a rough feeling, like how many of you feel that it's, it's a dangerous thing to share, say, the zip code that you either currently live in or were born in? Does that feel dangerous, not that dangerous? I would say, like, not, not super dangerous. Lots of people live in my zip code. Um, birthday, yeah, I mean... It feels a little weird to give it to a stranger, but what can you do with my birthday, right? You can figure out how old I am. Um, and then, I don't know, say my gender, right? Male, female, you can probably guess it from my name, in fact. Um, all right, so those things seem innocuous enough together, but there's a girl, I believe at MIT, who did this research back in the 2000s, um, said that given just those three pieces of information, you can pinpoint 87% of people in the US uniquely. Um, so I was like, oh, that's, that's really scary. Um, and what do technologists do when they hear about really scary things? They go download big data sets. So I, I went and downloaded all the people that have ever been born in California um, because somebody left PHP MySQL at men open. But ignoring that part, um, we had this data set and I found myself immediately. Um, I found the girl that I was dating immediately. I found my sisters immediately. It was really scary. Um, of course, it made me want to set up a, a horoscope website. It's like, I'm figuring out your future um, all I need is your birth date to align the stars and your gender and your, where you were born and it would do a whole bunch of fancy animations be like, your name is this! And then for your next horoscope, you pay me $500. Um, but it, it's scary because we give off a lot more entropy than we think we do. Um, our preferences, even just our, our birth date, narrows things down a lot. And, and to reiterate another point that, that um, we were talking about earlier, it's not whether or not inferences may factually be made from those sorts of, of, of data exposure um, that ought to concern us, it's that people think they can be made and they'll act on it whether or not it's really possible or not. I mean, the, people will build business propositions around that. They will act on it in other ways. Uh, a very famous example was uh, a social network analysis of friending patterns on Facebook uh, year before last that, that claimed to be able to determine to a plus 70 percent degree of accuracy whether or not somebody was gay based on their friend patterns. Um, is that an innocuous piece of information? I don't know. In, in, in my culture at this particular moment in my culture's evolution that is not an innocuous piece of, of information to have about somebody. People will act on that. Some people will act on that in ways that are relatively benign but a lot of parties might be moved to act in ways that, that are active threats to me based on an inference that they've made because they believed it was possible, because they believed they now had the tools at hand 
to make a kind of concrete established, uh, you know, to be able to say something meaningful about somebody based on nothing more than, than their, their revealed patterns of friend behavior. And so again, it's not whether that's technically possible that even concerns me so much. I, I sort of assume it is technically possible, but I'm not equipped to make a judgment as to whether or not it's actually um, uh, could be done in any given circumstance. What really bothers me is the idea that people will be acting on information that uh, they think is just suggestive enough to give them the pretext of action. And uh, that, to me, is such a big... Uh, I, I don't even know how to respond to that. I mean, you can't regulate the sorts of inferences that people make about things. So I don't know where to take that. I just It just makes me hyper alert of the things that I give away constantly, whether I want to or not, and that I cannot help giving away. I mean, the, the, the things about the way in which I move through space and time and the patterns of association I make, um, it, they have become actionable, even weaponized, in a way that I don't think would have been possible a couple of years ago. And you don't want that to make you neurotic and, and you know, um, paranoid. But I, I do think it's worth thinking about and remembering uh, for as much of the time as you can stand thinking about it. Um, getting back to the, the technical solutions, Aza, you mentioned um, among the, the, the number of different creative solutions that have been developed to try and enhance awareness among people of their privacy online. And a lot of these were, um, uh, were to be used in, in browsers. Um, the privacy icons, for instance, you mentioned P3P. Um, but people seem to be using apps to access the internet increasingly over browsers, uh, and especially on mobile devices. What kind of strategies exist or could be developed for greater control over one's information in, in an app environment? Do you read Wired? <laughs> the internet's not dead. <laughs> um, in, in fact, apps are generally just another view into, uh, into the web. So uh, the reason why we, we like browsers is because browsers are moving towards being the user agent. Um, not just the user agent in terms of the name, but actually being your agent on the web that disintermediates you between the services that you use uh, so that, say, you don't have to sign in anymore, use passwords, which are known to be poor methods of, of securing an account. Uh, so if you can interject yourself in between um, the sign-up process and using a service, so that you can show what that service is going to do. Right? That, that's why we wanted to, to put privacy icons there. You would go to a site for the first time. You click a button that's like, sort of like Facebook Connect, but like Browser Connect. It connects you to your, your site. And just before you click, like, yep, give them my data, it's like, and by the way, here, here are the icons. They're in machine-readable format, so we can call them up. You can do the exact same thing in, in apps. Um, and in fact, I think at the beginning, it, it'll be mostly opt-in. Um, where you want to appear to be a good actor, and once you hit a critical threshold, which really is just go get you know, the bottom half of the Alexa 500 signed up to use this thing, um, people will start you know, sort of expecting to see, like, wait, why, why is this icon not here? Um, does that mean they're going to do something mean with my data? And so and really, it, it's not all that different when, when you're in the app world, um, because it's still really about making it visible what, what you're doing. Um, and often I think it's, it can be combined with, with marketing. So in Massive Health, we're certainly taking advantage of the fact that you have a cell phone in your pocket, your doctor is not in your pocket, or at least hopefully shouldn't be, um, and taking data about you. And we want to use that data to help predict what kinds of problems you may have so you can get them early um, or set you up with people that have solved similar problems to the ones you're going through right now three months earlier so you have a strong mentor mentory relationship. But each time we use that data, you want to make it very clear that you're giving up this data for this value proposition. Mm -hmm. um, you're getting something back, so it's a real transaction. Uh, because as soon as that's broken, uh, it really feels like you're just being, being a leech or a phantom uh, latching onto something. So in that point, you're using marketing um, and value proposition as privacy. Right? Those things get wrapped up. And as soon as you disassociate them, that, that's when the problems begin. Mm -hmm. The disintermediation, though, um, to me anyway, it, it, it means it's just another way for the user to be disconnected from how these technologies work. And a lot of the conversation we were talking about, we've had today, where we're talking about these data flows and increasing awareness about 
how this data is being collected and where it's going to are, are pretty complex. Um, and for our office, certainly, in terms of consciousness raising, um, it's a huge challenge to try and communicate these very, very complex topics to the average internet user. Do you guys have suggestions on how that, how that could be done? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, as ever, it's a design challenge. And, and the, the trouble is, as we've observed before, is that design doesn't scale very well. I think that any arbitrarily complex circumstance can be explained to any user of, of arbitrary intelligence um, in you know a, a relatively small number of steps. If you've got an infinite amount of resources to apply to you know uh, content strategists and people who craft copy and, and the information architects to do the navigational structure and the visual designers, I think if you have the right mindset and the access to the right resources, any arbitrarily complex body of, of law or regulation can be communicated to people in, in something as simple as high-level icons. That's, that's not a problem to me. The, the problem is that most of the people developing these technologies, uh, my concern would be, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about this, this ubiquitous computing stuff we're talking about is that it gets easier and easier to develop technologies that are compliant uh, you know, with the internet that speak with the other network devices that are out there. It becomes easier for people with no technological development background to build software, even hardware. Um, and so the, the decision nexus of people that you have to get agreeing on the value of these communications um, and uh, their ability to, to marshal resources, you know, of, of talented and thoughtful and, and compassionate designers, you know, when, when that decision nexus explodes, you know, if you had three companies that between them made all the browsers and, you know, then they could hire the designers. I mean, in a sense, that, that's not necessarily the world that I would want to live in. But you could certainly say those companies could develop the resources to explain these complicated ideas to people in easy, visual, um, digestible manner. When you've got literally on the order of tens of millions of people in the world who are empowered to design, develop, and deploy technologies for this universe, not all of whom remotely have the same conceptions of privacy or of its importance. Not all of whom um, are, are, frankly, you know, acting on our behalf. Some of whom are, are, are black hats. Some of whom are bad guys, right? Um, it's just as easy for them to develop and deploy things as it is for, you know, a self-styled self good people. So, you know, I, I, I do ultimately think that there's something to the argument of... Um, the again, I, I feel like I'm sort of endorsing a transactional or market-based approach to things, um, maybe because I am, but it, it, it's not that it doesn't disturb me, but that letting the market decide that, that there is uh, value in privacy by putting these like very high visibility indicators on there. And then you know, like letting people choose and seeing that hopefully over time, people choose to use the things which have been developed with an eye towards protecting their prerogatives. Um, but I, I can only hope that. I don't necessarily have any evidence beyond the browser wars of the turn of the millennium to, to line up against uh, or in favor of that. Oh, I think you, you see it a lot at, at the supermarket. When you see, if you go up and down Whole Foods, everything proclaiming, like, yeah. no, whatever the new hip sure. drug is. Um, would you like, wait, does that mean every other food has oh, that drug? Or, or fair trade. Or fair trade, or exactly. Trade. Keeping seal of approval is sort of the, the famous one, right? I mean, I think that there is value to these things. I, 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 I think it's probably the best we can do. It doesn't mean it's particularly satisfactory to me. I think it's a suboptimally optimal solution. <laughs> Nicely put. Are there any questions from the audience? Do you want to use the mic? Tell us who you are. Hello, my name is Edward. I work for Shopify. Um, we're an e-commerce company here in Ottawa. So last year we did like maybe a hundred million dollars in sales for our merchants. Really proud of that. It's awesome. Except, so I'm in charge of the API, and I'm really curious if you have any uh, examples of good legal instruments like disclaimers or regulation uh, about that secondary usage of data for developers that you're talking about. I know that Facebook really clamps down on what you can do with it. You can't hold on to the data for more than like 24 hours or whatever. But like you mentioned, it's only good if you actually read it and understand it. Do you have any ideas about that sort of thing? Um, 
So we are currently going through the exercise of trying to codify those things in human understandable English. Um, the EU has spent a lot of time talking about like what does secondary use mean, um, but there it's still sort of uh, it takes some sitting down with it to to go through it. Um, so hopefully in the next month or two we'll, we'll actually have like a nice document that says, voila, this this makes it easier. Uh, in terms of other APIs that have done a really good job of that, I don't have any off the top of my head. Does Flickr have a good one? I think that they've kind of fallen back off of their, their best game. But uh, as of a couple of years ago, Flickr was doing some really interesting work around embedding Creative Commons licenses in the API for, for shared objects. Um, and I, I just I, I don't think they're doing that anymore. But at one point in time, it was an active... Um, you know, certainly an active development initiative over there. Yeah. I think CC Mixer and a couple of the other Creative Commons music sites had interesting APIs where it came along with the metadata, so you knew exactly how and where to, to display it. Um, and, th and that seemed, seemed reasonable. Does that address your question particularly? Well, in my case, uh, we're getting a lot of third-party apps that are popping up. So this means a lot of third parties are now getting in contact with customer data. So if I shopped at one of these stores, uh, I wouldn't be aware that this data is getting into, you know, like a product recommendation engine's hands. And I don't know what that guy does with the data. And yeah, I think it's the best thing that you can do, because you, you clearly can't audit necessarily, unless you did honeypots or something crazy yeah. like that, um, is to take the, the CDTs and, and Alyssa Cooper's rule set idea, and along with every piece of data you send over, send a little JSON blob that says, this is how we think the data should be used. Um, and at least that sets the precedent of like the way that you guys want it to be used, and they can still abuse it. There's, you're not stopping that, but that way later you can go back and say like, look, don't you're doing it wrong. I don't have any idea what a JSON blob means because I don't either. It's one of those 1950 creatures from the Grey Lagoon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That actually makes sense. Are there any other questions in the audience? Hi, my name is Sophie, and I work at the OPC. My question is for Adam, and I can't see you. I can't see you either. <laughs> Howdy. Hi. Uh, the open public objects model is very interesting, but I was wondering if there's room for consent in there, because it seems that as soon as the data is open and that no one's profiting from it, then it's OK. But I can't consent to a billboard capturing sure. my, uh, so is there any room for consent in, that, in a model such as that one? There's. Uh, yeah. There's room for anticipation, right? There's room for proactive uh, ability to control your, your exposure to some of these things. And in that way, consent can be reified. Um, you know, if you do not consent, there are definitely, for example, I'm thinking of critical cartography, which was a project of, of Tad Hirsch at MIT a couple of years ago. And it was essentially a map of the city that showed the, the domains of operation of all of the surveillance cameras that he was able to identify. And at the very least, that gave people the option of, of taking paths through the city that didn't expose themselves or expose themselves to the minimum degree of surveillance possible. The obvious trouble, I can see it in your face, you know, the obvious trouble is, A, then the onus is on the individual you know, to take, uh, at times, radically inconvenient paths that, that wind up uh, you know, taking several times as long as, as the, uh, the, the shortest point. Um, so you know, why should the onus be on the individual? Why should they have to make, and, and just practically speaking, who's going to cut around the island of Manhattan to avoid a camera when you know, their, their appointment is in 10 minutes and they have to cut straight across the island? The, the further complication is, of course, these days, there may not be literally a, a square centimeter of the city that isn't in the ambit or the field of vision of some kind of data collection device. So does the open public object model afford the idea of consent? Um, it does, I just think, as, as a user experience consideration, it's very, very hard to make that happen, right? Like if, I, for, for a couple of just very pragmatic reasons, let's say there was that billboard and it, it had somehow superimposed over it the idea that, you know, appearing in front of this billboard, you know, it, it is collecting information. Um, in a sense, maybe you, you wind up skewing their data model so badly by putting that there that, that you cut down on the value of them collecting the data at all, which would be, from my perspective, an optimal outcome. Um, but it's, it's very, very hard to give people 
ahead enough in time and space of their encounter with these, these data collection resources, the meaningful ability to make choices about them. And so I do kind of fall back to this other notion of at least make the access open and symmetrical so that nobody can take differential benefit based on it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid, again, it's just not a very satisfying answer for those of us who would just as soon opt out of all of these things. So I just don't want to have to walk around with tin foil over my face no. when I... No. <laughs> and, culture jamming stuff I've seen, mm -hmm. sure. um, where some hackers is like, oh, this is awesome. Um, printers and scanners no longer will scan a dollar bill. That's right. Um, so let's put that on t-shirts so that when people take pictures of us, like it just will not take a picture because it thinks it's a dollar bill. Now, it, that didn't work out all that well. But that idea is interesting. Dazzle, where camouflage, makeup, right. burkas, uh, you know, digital burkas, all of these things. I, I, the, the, the ingenuity is is fantastic but but my contention is that again that puts the question in the realm of a technical arms race to defeat the the specific provisions of a specific technology well you could certainly imagine and not necessarily arguing for this but you can imagine a QR code that you wear on your person that says like I'm opting out anything you any time any visual thing sees this just means yeah. I'm out yeah. or or my cell phone if we want to make it a little bit less geeky if I'm carrying it with me and it has cone its own yeah cone of silence sort of thing it's yeah. just like it it says it just always is broadcasting a little signal that says like I'm I'm out. Yeah. Um. Th those are possibilities. In which case, the the regulatory response becomes something like the national do not call registry, and and I think that that's actually probably a pretty decent way to go about it. I'm still sort of viscerally offended by the notion that I should have to take action to protect myself. Um. I think I should be. Uh. You know. I, we should collectively be engaged in our mutual protection from the get go. But uh, just in terms of, of practical self-defense, I think that's probably a reasonable suggestion. And, and there, there are, you know, I always used to joke about the, the chain of coffee houses that I wanted to start that was called Faraday's because it would be, you know, <laughs> Faraday cages. And you could go there if you just wanted to be offline entirely. But uh, unfortunately, even the, the act of being seen walking into a Faraday's is, is suggestive <laughs> in and of itself. Thanks. Other questions? <clears throat> Hi, my name's Anton. Uh, I work for IBM, and my question doesn't necessarily reflect their view. It's uh, more of a personal thing. Um, there, it's, I'm picking up on, on something that Aza said about massive health, about um, keeping a phone in your pocket and letting it collect data for your, your personal health uh, benefits. Um, is there a way of balancing the individual privacy and the public benefit? Because that, that data, uh, there are many tiers to the uses of that data. It could be use, useful for the one person. It could be useful for the person's doctor. It could be useful uh, sort of more in a, in, a, in a city level for trends and, and, and uh, patterns. And ultimately, it could be useful for drug companies. Is there a way to sort of balance and curb um, the privacy, but also let let some of that data trickle out so that other people can benefit for humankind as well. I mean, it's a it's a really really hard problem. Um, so while my brain catches up uh, while I say random things, um, a lot of it I think will always come down to making it very clear what that transaction value is. Um, if when you give up your data, um, you get to see the infographic that comes back. Uh, and I think it would be really cool if you can access that data and do other interesting things with it. If it's a public benefit thing um, and it ends up in the public domain, uh, then even though it might be abused, it can be equally abused by all sides, um, and, and that can help a, a whole bunch. Um, one of the things that, that we did at Mozilla, which I, which I thought is, is cool, is uh, we started a, a program called Test Pilot, um, which takes data about how people use the browser. Uh, because we got to be like 300 million users and realized we didn't have good data on how people are using it. Like that's, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't do that anymore. Um, but now we're left with this big set of data on where people are clicking. And, and we did clever things like you send down experiments and they come back up. So we're not collecting it all the time. You're collecting it for specific amounts of time. And people know when that's happening. So it's just selection bias. So there's some interesting problems there. But then we take that data. Um, and we have research institutions, which are typically data starved. And we're like, here, here is this data chunk. Um, 
please do public benefit work with it. Um, and that way, we're trying to get around the, the problem that, that AOL ran into and Yahoo ran into, where you take a lot of data, you put it out there, and maybe somehow because of entropy, you end up divulging information you didn't want to. But at the same time, creating public benefit works uh, that, that could inf take all this data and do interesting things with it. Um, and my guess is that the, the line between having the data sit in your pocket um, and benefit just you, or just you and your doctor, just you and your family and your doctor, and then you and your family, your doctor, and your friends, or the people that you live with, and then like, those, those le levels of an onion, um, that each one of those steps, the more you, you can give back and you have a wider group of people looking at it to, to do good with it, is, is sort of the right frame that I'm, that I'm trying to think about it through. It's a hazy answer, sorry. Hello. This question is actually for our host. So to take a cue from Aza's book, what the hell is Pipita? And, uh, <laughs> and like, are there any examples where it's benefited my life? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, my boss is in the audience. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> Pipita is... Um, is, is the private sector privacy legislation. And it's, it's one of two pieces of legislation that uh, our, our, our commissioner is in charge of and, and we're in charge of, of enforcing. Um, it's uh, the second part of your question, how does it benefit you or how does it, what was it? Are there any examples that I might know about where it's actually come in and it's been enforced or it made mm -hmm. a difference in mm -hmm. my life or in the greater societies? Well, that, actually it wouldn't be last year now, it's, Two years ago, we investigated Facebook, and we got them to change. Uh, oh yeah, Harley Finkelstein. I work with him. He's Harley. that guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't know that this was part of that. So we, um, but we have uh, we have done some investigations into into online companies. I mean, Facebook is is one of the bigger ones. We also did. Um, uh, some work into Google. You can go onto our website and read all about this. Okay. Um, and those are just the online examples. But I mean, Pipita, in, in terms of a piece of legislation, also applies to any commercial transaction. Um, so if you have ever gone into a store and been asked to provide your driver's license as proof of identification in order for you to return something that you bought two weeks before, um, that's an instance where the legislation would come into play. Okay, so when I show up and I'm like, I would like to show you my health card, it's you guys who are like, you can't do that. Well, the health card is different because that's a provincial piece of Oh, okay. Of, of it's not the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for Adam. My name is Warren. I'm also from Shopify. Um, a lot of the examples you gave were very uh, corporate ones. And... I've, I've seen a couple in Toronto where they were really fun, they're really interactive, like one from TD where they had this soccer game and stuff like that. I almost think that if we have these things, would they be a fun wrecker? I don't, if, would it take that value out of it? Um, I, I, I like the visibility of it, but just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I'm not so much about fun. <laughs> 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 so like the Nokia thing, or sorry, not Nokia, Nokia, um, the uh, Nikon thing with the camera. Um, was there not people enjoying that, like really would, interacting would, with that and Would you that? have enjoyed it? I think so, yeah. You would, you would have enjoyed yeah. being like flashes? I think enough? it would have been a cool, it's a, it's a cool awesome. concept. I think, uh, what? Uh, you, don't, you don't know? Yeah, okay. Awesome. <laughs> I, okay. It's, there, it's, a, it's kind of thing. So there may the be, the honestly, audience. there may be a generational split here. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, I, but I also think that, I don't mean to lean too heavily on this, but you know, that could tri trigger an epileptic seizure. Right? I mean, it, it's, it's just, it's thoughtless and it's disruptive. And you might dig it, but mm -hmm. not everybody else around you until, you know, maybe 70 years from now when everybody's your age or, or younger. <laughs> um, you know, like, like they, they'll all dig it. But for right now, I find that obnoxious. Mm -hmm. You know, I find it really kind of crass and kind of an intrusion onto my ability to operate and enjoy public space. That's like radically at variance with my expectations of, of behavior and comportment. So, um, Public artwork, which totally. you're like, ah, that giant clothespin. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Philadelphians are yeah. out of lock on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Like, um, yeah, you know, it, it is. And so these are, that's precisely why I say this is to be hashed out, you know, in every different place where these issues arise. I don't think that there's any such thing as a universal standard. I mean, I, I, I offer these examples 
because they're the ones that first sort of triggered my thinking about them. But I absolutely do not expect that, that that's going to be compelling or persuasive in and of itself. I don't expect you know, you in Ottawa or, or you amongst your friends or, or any group of you uh, to, to um, craft legislation or, or, or bodies of practice around this stuff that is quite isomorphic with what my expectations would be. I don't have that expectation at all. It's just like, surely there must be some use or some collection of information in public space that would abrade your sensibility in the same way that that particular instance abraded mine. And are they, is there enough in common about these cases that we would take similar measures to uh, ameliorate or mitigate or prevent them? That's all. Fair enough. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question about your, your stuff, okay. if you don't mind. Um, so a, a lot of what you're saying is like you ha it has to be an addressable uh, object. Um, you have to be able to access it, and the, the code for it should be open. Um, the, the analogy in my mind is, is that of the web. Every web page is, in fact, view sourceable. You can, you can open it up and look at what's going on. Yeah. Um, it, it's hackable. You yes. can inject whatever you want into your own local version. Um, and we still have all these tracker things because the, the guts of it are hidden beyond a web socket, essentially, right? They're sending data to someplace else, um, and that thing is no longer a public right. thingy mobile. Right. Like the, co the cookie itself is not human readable. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, it's not. It's not that those provisions that I talk about are in any way a panacea, but they're they're trying to level the playing field a little bit, and make it just a little bit easier to take. You know, in a sense, it, the the analogy is the that of of the web, and we have been relatively successful. Although there are clearly people who are arguing that that the entire internet architecture needs to be torn down and reinvented because we. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's been, a, uh, on balance, a relatively productive thing. And I, I think we've, we've successfully prevented the worst outcomes from arising. Uh, so there's, there's, you know, something to be learned from that. I mean, you know, there's a reason why we joke about Nigerian 419 scams instead of um, all being taken in by them. It's because we've developed a cultural immune system a around that. Um, there's a reason why there are, um, you know, privacy spam detection filters. You know, we, we all... I mean, these days we have the sort of the social plausible deniability of, you know, if somebody's sending you mail and you don't want to respond, say, oh, I'm sorry, it must have gotten eaten by spam filter. Well, that spam filter's there for a reason. Um, we've been relatively good about training our collective immune system on the Internet, I would argue. As strange as that may sometimes seem, it's been, on balance, um, uh, actually, the, 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 it's been a successful battle. And so that is precisely and explicitly the analogy I start with in considering public space. Are there other Hello? questions? I've got one last question for you two before I hand it over to the Assistant Commissioner to uh, offer some closing remarks. Um, so it's a question for both of you, but considering um, Edward asked me a question, I think I'll flip it around and also ask him and, and, and other folks in the audience. Over the last few months, we've invited a number of privacy experts and advocates to our, to our office. Um, and inevitably, the conversation always turns to reaching out to developers. And we hear this again and again. You as an, as an office, you need to go out and engage developers. You need to understand them better and engage them as part of the solution on privacy. How do we do that? <laughs> that doesn't involve <laughs> bribing them with, with alcohol. <laughs> You're lost. <laughs> My, my only, you know, I, I don't have any special insight into the developer community, but I would say go to where they are, you know, like, like, uh, and weirdly enough, maybe it does have something to do with alcohol, I don't know. My, my company uh, does a weekly drinks, you know, we just say, hey, Fridays at 7, we're going to be at such and such a bar. Um, you know, if, if you're looking for a clever people, a clever group of people to hang out with, fun, interesting, smart people, we'll be in such and such a place every single Friday night at 7. Um, you know, maybe you can't host that as an institution, but maybe you can partner with somebody who can. And, um, you know, be social. Be out in the community. Don't, don't necessitate that people come to your office or even, frankly, come to your events. Um, go to where the people are. You know, participate. Delegate people to say, hey, you know, go, go uh, cultivate this community, this community, this community. Um, have local agents. Things you, you can do. Um, Sunlight Foundation has done a really good job of, of doing codathon or hackathons where they have interesting data sets, interesting goals, you get people together. Um, it's, a, it's a 
time windowed box and you, you get people to work on something interesting. Yeah. Um, and then you highlight it, right? You guys have something fantastic, which is a bully pulpit. Um, there is a way to reach out across all of Canada to make a huge difference. As, as a developer, you're like, well, what can I do as one person? I can make a little bit of code. These two things together are really, really powerful. It's why people work on open source projects, because they work with people they really like that they've never met before on things that are bigger than just them. Um, and any time you can bring those things together and take your size and prowess um, and combine it with the agileness of the developer and you, you can sell that vision, um, then people are going to want to come and do it because it's a hard problem, it's an interesting problem, uh, and, and that's the way I'd approach it. I think that speaks really to the developer mindset. And I think that's really nicely put. Mm -hmm. yeah. you sure. Okay. Um, will you guys actually forgive me if, if I take off at this juncture? I have oh. to be, I, I need to be somewhere else, okay. so I apologize. <clears throat> and That's I, okay. I it was good to meet you. Oh, hurrah. I'll see you later. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for having me, um, I, and I apologize for ducking out on short notice All like right. this. I just realized my appointment is nigh upon Imminent. me. So thank you very much again, and, and uh, it's been a wonderful time. <laughs> So I run a lot of the open data stuff in this town. And uh, from what we've learned, uh, the data itself is relatively boring. Uh, and developers come out when you can present them with interesting problems to work on. See you later. And users. That's really what we care about. Uh, we're interested in playing with technology for its own sake. And we'll come up with our own problems, like trivial ones that will make up like I owe you a beer apps, like all those things come from this desire to play with the technology. So if you say, hey devs, we have this interesting problem that is like low hanging fruit that we think you can hack on and we'll deliver all of these users to you, that's awesome. Bring me that and I'll bring you developers for sure. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, with that, I'll officially kind of close the, the panel and invite our assistant commissioner, Chantal Bernier, to uh, deliver some closing remarks. Merci Daphné. Effectivement, c'est à moi que revient le... Thank you, Daphné. I am very happy to thank our panelists. ...to generate new ideas, and I think uh, we really were uh, treated to some very, very special presentations today. From uh, Adam's proposal to address the perfect storm of insidious collection of personal information and then the monetization of that personal information to is as very concrete measures to uh, make the invisible visible. I have a new mantra now, as I, I want to let you know that. I think that was just so well put. And Daphne, thank you so much for generating such a rich discussion. And all of you for your questions. Uh, it really made it uh, truly inspiring. Je vais vous dire que notre prochaine... I will tell you that our next event will be held on the... 23rd of June, and next time it will be on service and public safety. I look forward to seeing uh, you all and more on June 23rd. Look on our blog for more details. Merci beaucoup.